Introduction Welcome to Butterfant. If you scratch the surface of this lively cork town, you will discover that it has deep medieval roots, full of tales of the entrepreneurial spirit that embodies the town. Like the stories about the medieval Lombards who made Butterfant their influential trading hub, or figures like John Anderson, who laid the foundations for the modern town. This audio guide, written by locals and produced by Abarta Heritage on behalf of Transport Infrastructure Ireland, will introduce you to the fascinating stories of Butterfant, and it includes the latest important archaeological discoveries. The guide is broken into a series of tracks, each with a particular tale to tell, beginning with one of the oldest features of the town, the Franciscan Friary. The Franciscan Friary. The medieval ruins of Butterven's Franciscan Friary are located to the rear of St. Mary's Catholic Church on the main street. The friary housed a thriving, vibrant religious community from the middle of the 13th to the 16th century. The Normans appreciated the importance of religious belief in people's lives. They had built an abbey for the Augustinian order in nearby Ballybeg in 1229, and in 1251, work commenced on the Franciscan friary here. Professor Tygo Keefe of University College Dublin identifies a number of phases in the friary's development. It was rectangular at first. Later, a transept was added, with a fashionable triumphal arch that faced southwards towards Barry's castle. The bell tower, always an integral part of the overall plan, was built in the final phase and placed equidistant from both gables of the friary. The friary's decline is part of a larger story. In the 1530s, Henry VIII, King of England and Ireland, broke with Rome, established the Church of England and passed the Act of Dissolution to close the Catholic monasteries. Many of those in England and Ireland who refused to acknowledge Henry as the head of the church were executed. Two wardens in this friary suffered such a fate, John O'Cahan and Bishop Botius MacEgan. But despite this and the severe penal laws of the 18th century that followed it, Franciscans continued to minister here until 1780. Noel Coleman tells us more about the story of the friary. The notice on the railings beside the main gate tell us David Oak Barry built this friary for the Friars Minor of St. Francis in 1251. While the Franciscan friary was home to a mendicant order that lived by preaching and begging, their patrons, the Barry family, financed several major redevelopments of the friary. Over the centuries, these expansions showed the growing wealth and power of the Barrys. But the friary also reminds us of the cycles of history. The friary had major calamities during its history and one stands out over the others. I always imagine the consternation when a resident walking along the main street one morning in 1814 was startled by the dramatic change in the skyline over the friary. He would have rushed to tell his neighbours, the great bell tower has collapsed. Even though silent for a long time, the bell tower had dominated the ruined friary for centuries. Before that, the bell tower regulated the monks' daily lives. Its tolling called them to regular prayer and worship. Now, a lasting reminder of the monastic religious lives of the brothers of St. Francis was gone. The collapse of the bell tower greatly damaged an already fragile and crumbling structure. Fortunately, during the 1850s, groups of people were inspired to promote an appreciation of what our ancestors had bequeathed to us in the way of language, music, games and our built heritage. 
Among these were eminent architects and antiquarians. With the enthusiastic cooperation of Canon Buckley, who built St. Mary's Catholic Church, the rubble of the interior of the friary nave and chancel was removed, and architectural remnants or spoilia were collected and inserted in the north wall as a sort of medieval museum for the curious, as the antiquarian Richard Brash described it. As well as architectural fragments, they also collected a large quantity of human remains and bones, and for some years these provided a ghoulish interest for visitors. In the fairly recent past, the bones were reinterred in the crypt under the friary. St. Mary's Catholic Church St. Mary's Church was constructed in 1836 under the supervision of Father Con Buckley. Lord Donorale provided the site within the grounds of the Franciscan Friary, and he also gave a generous donation towards the costs of construction. The church was designed by architect Charles Cotterell of Cork, and it incorporates the old Desmond Tower that dates to around 1400 AD. The church has been designed in a neo-Gothic style with a cruciform shape. It was built using finely hewn limestone sourced from the quarry at the rear of the nearby Lombard's Castle. The beautiful stained glass windows are a special feature of St. Mary's. The north window over the high altar was designed and supplied by Mr. Mayor of London. Designed in stunning Munich glass, in its centre is the figure of Jesus Christ. On his right is the Virgin Mary, and on his left, St. Joseph. It also contains 15 angels playing various musical instruments. The dedication on the window reads, For the glory of God and beauty of his temple, this window was erected by Mrs. Margaret Tracy of Rathclare in memory of her parents, John and Mary Walsh. Over on the south-facing wall, above the entrance, you can also see the stunning rose window. The Desmond Tower, which is incorporated into the east-facing wall of the church, is believed locally to have been built by the Earl of Desmond. According to legend, the heartbroken Earl had the door to the tower constructed ten feet above the ground, so he could remain in solitude after his wife's death in childbirth. St. John's Church. The St. John's Church that we see today was designed by the renowned architects, the Payne Brothers, and was built in 1826. It was originally known as St. Bridget's Church, as this was the site of an early Irish church that predated the Norman invasions. The Bridget of this site was the daughter of Lennon of Killingeen Lennon and sister of St. Coleman, first bishop and patron saint of this diocese, Cloyne. Bridget is an important figure in Budavent, and a number of local monuments are named in her honour, like St. Bridget's Holy Well, Biddy's Tree, and St. Bridget's Graveyard. In the 13th century, the invading Norman family, the de Barrys, built two walls around Budavent, and this site, with St. Bridget's Church, was enclosed within the outer wall, protecting it from any unrest between the Irish and Normans. The outer wall abuts the churchyard, and the southern gate was along this section of wall. St. John's Church is perhaps best known for its role in the very first steeplechase in history. Hear the story from Emily de Montfort. St. John's is a lovely quiet spot, back from the busy road, tucked under the trees. But in 1752, two local gentlemen, Edmund Blake, and Cornelius O'Callaghan had a huge argument. They were avid huntsmen, and legend tells us that on this day there was drink taken, and they argued over whose horse was the best hunter. We can imagine the scene, voices raised in anger, while onlookers encouraged the row. This would be settled with a wager and a race across open countryside. The starting and finishing points were the spires of St. John's Butterfant and St. Mary's Donorail, both beside the River Orbeg. The riders could pick a line between these two points and take in any obstacle, natural or man-made. 
that came there in their way, like a hunt. We can imagine the men, with the church behind them, waiting for the starter's orders. Bang, they were off. Through the trees and down to the river bank, then across the Orbeg, and through the rich farmland on the other side. But it wasn't all easy ground. There were ditches, double ditches, fences, walls, trees, streams and marshy ground to overcome. We can hear the thundering hooves, the panting horses, the men shouting encouragement and the whips snapping. And there was pride at stake. While the men chased from steeple to steeple, we don't know who won. But we do know this steeplechase gave its name to some of the greatest races in modern horse racing. And the Grand National at Aintree is the king of these. All that from this quiet and peaceful setting. During the Reformation, St. Bridget's Church, then a timber frame building, changed to a Protestant church and was renamed St. John's. This timber building was burnt down and in 1826 it was replaced with the magnificent stone church we see today. The Payne brothers designed several churches in the area, for Moy, Castletown Roach, Mallow, and here we see several of their signature details. For example, its shape resembling a Greek cross. Reverend Charles Bunworth was a noted Irish harpist, benefactor of harpists, and served as rector here in the 18th century. When he died, he owned 15 harps, bequeathed to him by the last of the wandering harpists. The Bunworth harp was his favourite. It was given to his granddaughter, Miss Dillon of Cork, and thence to her nephew, Thomas Crofton Croker. Croker was a famous antiquarian and collected Irish fairy tales. The Brothers Grimm later translated Croker's collection to German. The Bunworth harp is currently in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Bunworth had received his MA from Trinity College Dublin and in time helped John Philpot Curran to prepare for the Trinity entrance exams. Curran was a famous 18th century orator and barrister and was father of Sarah Curran, Robert Emmett's fiancée. Today, St. John's still attracts many people who wish to trace their ancestors and visit their graves, in particular the resting place of those men who were garrisoned at the military barracks in Buttevant. Ballybeg Priory. Located approximately one kilometer south of Buttevant, you can discover the ruins of Ballybeg Priory, one of the best preserved medieval priories in Ireland. It was founded in 1229 by Philip de Barry for the Canons Regular of St. Augustine, an order of priests who lived according to monastic rule. The priory was dedicated to St. Thomas a Becket of Canterbury, and the first prior was David de Cardigan, who, like the Priory's founder, was Welsh. Ballybeg was constructed in the English Gothic style. The rooms you can see today represent a large church and bell tower, with religious buildings and a cloister to the south. The lava, or basin, for the monks to wash their hands, can still be seen where a refectory once stood. The refectory was where the brethren used to eat communal meals. One of the most famous features of Ballybeg is a small circular tower located nearby to the southeast of the main ruins of the Priory. This is a dovecot or columbarium with 11 rows of roosting boxes that housed pigeons or doves. The meat and eggs of the birds provided an important food source for the community and their droppings were highly prized as fertilizer. Ballybeg's dovecot ensured the birds were dry and safe from predators, with a small doorway at ground level for the monks and an opening in the domed roof at the top so the birds could safely fly out. Another doorway, set high near the roof level, allowed a monk to clean out the roosts in order to collect the droppings for use in the gardens and fields. Here's Dolores Cronin and the story of the dovecot. You wouldn't believe the number of people who come and look at the dovecot. They come from all over the world. Visitors are always impressed with it. 
Of course, it is in perfect condition, bone dry and all its detail perfectly clear. It was a grand place to play in and we often played there as children. From the road, it looks as if it doesn't belong to the old monastic ruins. It stands in the middle of a field, a good bit away from them. But in its heyday, the monastery was huge and the dovecote was actually part of the buildings. An historian told me that the dovecote can tell them a lot about the type of monastery they had here. The monks were very wealthy and they were very powerful. The Augustinians were a particularly affluent order. They were diocesan administrators and played a key role in the bureaucracy of the Norman conquest. The priory in Ballybeg owned over 2,000 acres of land, along with numerous rectories across the diocese of Cloyne, from which they drew an income. Theirs was not a life of almsgiving, preaching and penance, such as lived by the Franciscans in Butterfin town. In 1541, Ballybeg Priory was eventually dissolved as part of the Dissolution of the Monasteries Act, and it was recorded as being in ruins by 1750. Parts of the ruin were used by a farm until the early 20th century. Today, it is an atmospheric place to explore and to experience a sense of Ireland's medieval past. <laughs> 